If you've done any work up at microwave frequencies, at some point you've probably had to design a filter. And if you're talking above 500 megahertz or so, then you really can't use discrete like resistors and capacitors to create your circuit because at those frequencies, the leads and the inductances in the leads and all the different parasitic elements that you'll find inside uh, your conventional lumped components are going to be so high that the filter doesn't actually behave the way that you've designed it to behave. But what you can do is use what's called uh, distributed components. And what these are are just little bits of metal that you etch out of your copper layer on your PCB. You basically design the structure so that these little things resonate in such a way that the filter exhibits a frequency response that you're actually looking for. If you take a closer look at some of the elements you can see on here, we've got a transmission line coming in. That thin track here, essentially at high frequencies, will behave like an inductor. And these fat pads here will, at high frequencies, behave like capacitors. And when I say this behaves like an inductor, that actually behaves like a series inductor. And that capacitor there would be a shunt capacitor. Because that's a, basically a capacitor to ground, assuming that there's a ground plane underneath here. There isn't on this ruler here, but this is just for the sake of explanation. That's all well and good, assuming you're getting a PCB fabricated, and also assuming that you're willing to wait four weeks for the PCB to arrive, and also assuming that you've designed the filter 100% correctly, and it's going to be good when you get it. And that's not always the case. I mean, a lot of the time you have to do a bit of guesswork getting the dimensions of these little filter elements correct. So what I'm going to do in this video is try and make some of these microstrip filters, but instead of uh, getting a PCB fabricated and then testing it with that, what I've got is I've got a bunch of uh, single-sided uh, copper-clad PCBs. You can see they're blank on one side, so I've got a ground plane on the bottom and that's blank on the other side. And I've got a bunch of copper tape. And I'm basically going to try and see if I can just use some vernier calipers to measure out little lengths of copper tape and then just tape it onto the uh, copper-clad PCB and see if we can make a filter that actually performs the way that it should. Before we move on to some of the more complicated filters, I want to show you first something really simple. What I'm building is a quarter wave bandstop filter. Nothing too complicated going on. Um, I'll actually go through how I got the measurements for the different parts later on in the video. I just want to give you a quick real time demo of how easy it is to just change tape up and move stuff around just using this. So I've got the spectrum analyzer hooked up to the output of the filter and then I've got the tracking generator putting a test signal into this filter, and you can see the frequency response of the filter here. If I just move it over a little bit, we're looking at zero up to about one and a half gigahertz here. We're sitting at a center around one gigahertz. If I go ahead and actually chop a bit of this stub off, you can see that the bandstop point has actually jumped up from 500 megahertz up to 600 megahertz. And that's because I've just decreased the wavelength of the stub, which means that the frequencies had to increase. And I can do that even more. And the beauty of using this way of prototyping is I can just cut it until I get to the point that I want. Say, for example, that I want a bandstop filter that works at, I don't know, 800 megahertz. That would be at the center here. So I can just cut a bit off. There we go, that's pretty much bang on. In reality, you probably want to remove these little bits of metal as well because they all start to resonate at high frequencies, but it doesn't really matter because we're working at a relatively low frequency here. We're only looking at 800 megahertz. Before moving on to a more complicated filter, I just want to quickly show you this thing. So this is called a radial stub, and it's another way of implementing a simple bandstop filter like I just showed you. You'll often see this on PCBs and wonder what that is. In this situation, it just does the same thing as an open stub, but you actually get a lot more bandwidth on the bandstop point. So before you would have seen that uh, the two uh, roll-offs on either side of the bandstop point were a lot closer together. Anyway, let's try something more interesting. Okay, so I've gone ahead and synthesized a filter. I've used a tool called QCS. This is an open source tool that you can just download from the internet. That's really cool. Go and check it out. I'll actually talk about how to synthesize filters using this tool later in the video. Um, but for now, we're just going to try and build one straight away and see if it actually works, and then we can do some more experiments. So what we've got here is what's called a stepped impedance low pass filter. Stepped impedance means that each one of these tiny little microstrip elements has a different impedance. So the transmission line that we have coming in via our connector is going to have a width of 2.6 millimeters so that the characteristic impedance of the input trace is 50 ohms. Now, 
you can see that the width of these other traces is not 2.6 millimeters. So these are all going to have different characteristic impedances. Here we're talking about five ohms up to about 80 ohms where the fat tracks have the really small characteristic impedances and the small tracks have the really large characteristic impedances. And basically uh, this is going to behave like a low pass filter. Now I've put all the parameters in here as well according to the material that I've got. So I actually measured the uh, width of the PCB ER, which is the dielectric constant. I just took that as the normal dielectric constant for FI4, which is what the PCB material is made out of. And I went ahead and ran a simulation from 100 megahertz up to 10 gigahertz, and this is what the frequency response of the filter looks like. So here's 1 gigahertz here, and we can see that the 3 dB point, or the cutoff of the filter, is at about 1 gigahertz, which is what we want. It kind of attenuates down to about minus 30 dB and then it hops back up and does all this crazy stuff. So basically once we get past about double the cutoff frequency of the filter because we're using a microstrip filter, we'll start hitting the second order resonances of the components that we're making out of copper and that's why you see these peaks here. We can actually stop this from happening by chaining low pass filters together. So we could have a low pass filter with a 1 GHz cutoff and then after that, have a low pass filter with, say, a 3 gigahertz cutoff, and then have another low pass filter with double that, so a 6 gigahertz cutoff. And so you would be able to just basically stack all these low pass filters together and then you would smooth out this response. But for now, I'm not going to worry about this. We'll just see whether I can actually build it and see whether the frequency response that we measure is anything like what the simulation says. So there's nothing too complicated going on here. I've pretty much just stuck the tape on the PCB and then I'm using some vernier calipers and a ruler and a knife to just cut out all the segments. So basically I scored all the segments and then after scoring all the segments I started just pulling them off with a pair of tweezers in my fingers. Um, I was a bit scared actually that I'd accidentally cut through some of the segments so after pulling all the pieces of copper off I actually touched it up with a soldering iron on some of the joints just to make sure that they were actually connected properly uh, and also I soldered the connectors on. To test whether this actually works, I'm going to run it through a tracking generator and have a look at the result on the spectrum analyzer. So if I just connect the output of the tracking generator, which is a 0 to 1.5 GHz signal that tracks uh, the sweep of the spectrum analyzer to the input, and then I turn the tracking generator on. Okay, so I've got a nice flat 0 dBm uh, signal here from 0 all the way up to 1.5 GHz. It rolls off... Uh, 3 dB point here is about 1.6 GHz, so should be more than enough bandwidth to see where the cutoff of the filter we made is, uh, because it should be around here, around the 1 GHz mark. Now, because there are a couple of ripples in this line here, what I might do to make the measurement a bit more accurate is store this waveform, and then we'll record the response of the filter on top of it. Alright, so this is the tracking generator coming in, and then this other waveform here is the response of the filter. And that actually looks pretty good. I mean, the only issue I can see is that the cutoff frequency is detuned a bit, and we've got a bit of loss coming in at high frequencies. We're working at 200 MHz per division, so it looks like the actual filter cutoff is at somewhere more like 900 MHz. So, that's a little bit out. And these losses here, you can see how it gradually increases there. I'm guessing that's probably due to a number of things. One, I'm using FR4, which isn't a fantastic PCB material. Two, there's a chance that my transmission lines here, my 50 ohm match ones, aren't actually the correct widths, and that can cause this loss as well. Same with all the other elements in the filter. But yeah, I'm actually pretty happy with that. What I might try and do is trim some of the filter elements and see if I can kind of squish that response back over to 1 GHz. It's probably going to be more difficult for me to change some of these elements than other ones. For example, it'll be easy for me to, for example, shorten this thing, but it's more difficult for me to change the length of this. I had a look at the simulation, and I tried modifying the length of these elements, and that didn't change the frequency response very much. But I tried lengthening these little elements here up to about 2 centimeters in the simulation and that pushed the frequency response up to 1.1 GHz in the simulation. So what I'm thinking is, if I extend these two 1mm elements out 
a little bit to 20 millimeters. Then the frequency response of this should be a bit closer to having a cutoff at 1 gigahertz instead of at 900 megahertz, which is where it is at the moment. You'll notice that I accidentally break one of the tracks and then fix it up. This will make a small difference to the thickness of the copper where the new track interacts with it, but as you'll see, it doesn't seem to affect it very much. So that's pulled it up by about 50 megahertz or so, which is not too bad. If I kept hacking at it, I could probably get it closer, but I reckon I might have a go at something else for now. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly show you how I actually synthesize the filter in QCS first, and then we can move on to actually creating another filter and trying to build that. So if you head over to QCS's website, you see all these pretty screenshots and stuff, and after you downloaded it, you get a zip file. After you unzip that, you get a bunch of files here, and if you open Quux, Quux, I don't know how you're supposed to, <laughs> supposed to say that, QCS.bat, then you get basically the main uh, editor window. So it's actually really easy to use this tool um, and it's even easier to use the filter synthesis tool. So if you head on over to tools and then filter synthesis, there's also active filter synthesis just if you're interested in that's for like op amp circuits as well. But we're looking at filter synthesis today and if you look at for example LC ladder this is all kind of filters that you create with discrete elements, but we've also got uh, these microstrip filters that we can choose from, which is perfect. So what we actually built was a stepped impedance microstrip filter. So if I select that, you can see that we can select the filter type and this will basically influence the, the roll off characteristics and the ripple characteristics and all sorts of other filter characteristics. Uh, if I remember correctly, I chose a Butterworth for the one that we built. So you can just choose that. Uh, you put in the filter order. Uh, we built a seventh order Butterworth filter. And you put the corner frequency in, that's correct. Um, and then you've got to make sure to change these values to match your circuit board materials. So the relative permittivity here is going to be uh, about 4.5 for FR4. That actually changes a bit depending on the frequency that you're operating your circuitry at. Uh, but 4.5 is a good number for non ridiculous frequencies. Uh, you'll have to change, you might have to change the metal thickness. So if you're using one ounce copper, I think that's about 35 microns, don't quote me on that, so you'll have to change that, um, which I did obviously, and then that's the thickness of the PCB that you can just kind of measure with some vernier calipers. So, the other important thing here, because we were building a stepped impedance uh, filter here, is I actually changed the minimum and maximum widths such that one, the minimum width here, is going to be not so tiny that it's impossible for me to make and the maximum part here I made 50 millimeters so that uh, when I lay down a 50 mil wide piece of tape I don't actually have to cut the edges off. Anyway, once you've typed all these values in you can basically just hit calculate. I mean some of these values are wrong for what we built but don't worry about that for now. If I calculate that uh, it's complaining that our substrate's not going to give us good results, but let's just ignore that. It's still going to give us a filter. So, um, and I can just drag that window off to the side. And if I hit paste, then there we go. We get our beautiful filter. So there are a few things going on here. We've got basically these two ports, which are used for the simulation that's running here from 100 megahertz to 10 gigahertz. And we've also got our substrate properties and We've got an equation that allows us to look at the reflection coefficients in dB rather than linearly, which is a lot more useful. Uh, but anyway, so we could go ahead and build this, but you want to simulate it as well. So if I go simulate, it'll ask me to save it. Um, save it as whatever. And then you'll get this blank window. and It doesn't look very useful. So in QCS, you actually have to add a plot to be able to see what you've simulated. So if I go Cartesian and I just click on it on the uh, window, and then say I want to look at the frequency response of the filter, that is how much power is coming through it versus frequency, then I want S21 and I can just hit apply and OK and just press escape. So now if I just zoom in a little bit, let me just move this, there we go. We've got our frequency response from 0 up to 10 gigahertz. Alright, so I want to try something a little bit more extravagant this time. I want to try and make another filter 
this time I'm thinking we should try going all the way up to 10 gigahertz. So may or may not work, hopefully it does, but we'll see. And this time I want to try building a bandpass filter instead of a low pass filter, which is what we built before. So let's have a look. We've got a couple of microstrip options, but I want to go microstrip end coupled. And what that's actually going to look like is basically a bunch of uh, pieces of coupled transmission line with some gaps to separate them. That's pretty much what this is going to look like, where we've got uh, the input on one side and the output on the other side. Not that it really matters. I mean, you can have the signal coming in and going out, or you can have the signal coming in this side and going out the other side. It doesn't really matter. It's reciprocal. Uh, but yeah, so that's what it'll look like. And let's just choose Chevy Chev, because why not? And I'm going to choose a fifth order filter. Let's see. Let's the only thing that I think I'm going to need to change here is the simulation options because see how if I actually if I simulate this now I'm just going to call this uh, 10 gigahertz bandpass filter if I simulate this and I just have a look at the frequency response we're only plotting from 9.7 gigahertz up to 1.03 gigahertz so it would be useful for us to see a lot more than that and the way I can change that is I just go in and change the S parameter simulation options and I'll go from 100 megahertz up to, I don't know, 30 gigahertz or so. Um, you can change all the steps and stuff as well, but don't need to worry about that. Resimulate. There we go. So, uh, this looks quite good actually. I do not think we're going to get anywhere near those transmission characteristics as far as attenuation goes because we're going to get a lot more leakage than that. So these spacings here basically the S indicates how far between uh, these rectangles, these um, pieces of transmission line are going to be, and the L's on the pieces of transmission line indicate how long they are. The widths are going to be the same for everything because it's just 50 ohm matched. So. You'll notice if I actually go up and do a line calculation, so this is what I would do um, to figure out what a 50 ohm match line looks like or some other impedance. So I basically can put all my substrate parameters in. So if I put in a 4.2 and then uh, I'm looking at 1.45 millimeters height and da -da -da -da. Yeah, it looks about right. So oh, I thickness 35.56 micrometers synthesize and see how we've got uh, 2.83 millimeters as our characteristic impedance uh, microstrip width and that's pretty close to what we have here there's probably something here that I'm missing I'm not sure exactly what oh one gigahertz maybe that is gonna change it there we go all right so that's a lot closer okay let's go and build it Okay, so is it going to work? I think that it'll probably kind of work, but not very well. To test it out, I've got a test oscillator here, and that's going straight into the filter, and then the output of the filter is going into the spectrum analyzer. Now, up at 10 gigahertz, the output of this test oscillator, uh, the amplitude actually changes a little bit, so I'm going to do a recording of just uh, the test oscillator going straight into the spectrum analyzer first, and then I'll go into doing a recording of the test oscillator going through the filter. Okay, I'm going straight from the test oscillator into the spectrum analyzer now, and that is the 10 gigahertz test tone. This big spur here is the 5 gigahertz feed through because it goes through an internal doubler in the PLL, so don't worry about that. Uh, if I move it around, I've got the analyzer in storage mode, so you can see that it will record the amplitude variations as I move that around. It might be a bit difficult to see. Anyway, if I go all the way down to 9 gigahertz, and then back up to 11 gigahertz we can see that the amplitude kind of varies 
along this line here. All right, so I'm actually going through the filter now. You can see that we've lost about 10 or 10 or 15 dB already, just straight through at 10 gigahertz. Um, we are getting some transmission, which is good. If I go up, Mm, yeah, okay, so if I go up in frequency, there is nothing. So it looks like our bandpass center is going to be definitely under 10 gigahertz. Um, but if I go down, keeping in mind this is 9 gigahertz down here. We seem to have two little peaks here, one at about 9.5 gigahertz and one around 10 gigahertz. And we're getting a lot of loss as well, and I'm not too surprised to be honest. I mean, you shouldn't really be using this PCB material all the way up at 10 gigahertz, and my measurements are probably not as accurate as they need to be to get this to work properly. But we are getting some transmission and a peak around 10 gigahertz, so I mean, it's better than nothing at all, but it's not particularly impressive. Still, it was interesting to try. Anyway, that's pretty much it for this video. I hope you liked it. If you've got any questions, let me know. I might actually try and get a hold on some more exotic materials to see if this actually works at high frequencies with different materials. I think the limitation here is really the measuring instrument more than anything else and my fingers. Uh, but still, that was a bit of fun, I think. So, uh, catch you later.